So thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is John Mitchell. I'm a biochemical geneticist at the Montreal Children's Hospital in Montreal, Quebec. And we're here today to talk uh, about Farber disease. And I have with me uh, Dr. Paul Hamartz. So uh, I would like if he could uh, tell us a little bit about himself. Thanks, John. Um, I'm Paul Harmatz. I'm a pediatric gastro gastroenterologist at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. Um, I've spent most of my time working with mucopolysaccharide storage disease. So Farber is a, a bit of field, and I've collaborated very happily with John um, uh, as our uh, Canadian expert in mucopolysaccharide disease. Um, in, appreciate coming together and talking about Farber and learning from John on this uh, this really devastating but extremely rare and difficult to recognize disease. John. Yeah, and I think I think that was one of the things we wanted to talk about Paul is you know it is a, it is an ultra rare disorder and and it is quite devastating. Um, there is quite a bit of heterogeneity. How do most of the patients come to you in your practice, or how have they come to you, or how do you think they could come to you uh, in your practice? Um, thanks, John. The, I mean, the, the third option is probably the most likely uh, situation. Most of the patients that we've seen have come um, through for the natural history study. Uh, when you when you work with these incredibly rare diseases, you it's hard to find single centers that that have taken care of a lot of the diseases. And uh, until there's a natural history or a clinical trial uh, for therapy, um, uh, you you don't get po real pockets of the disease unless it's a basic science interest that drags you into that sphere. So, but the range of patients that we've seen have been um, severe with onset early and um, uh, by two or three severe contractures, hoarseness, and nodules, tremendous pain, very high inflammatory state if you ran a sed rate you would come out a hundred or more um, you just have to be very careful you don't let this uh, uh, sort of fall into one of the um, autoimmune or jra uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis categories and have to keep thinking metabolic it's fortunate if it moves to a geneticist or a metabolic um, person um, first before it moves to a rheumatologist because they're used to dealing with extremely rare uh, syndromes than um, uh, driven by an underlying metabolic genetic disease. So. Yeah, I think that's been. Too, John? I think that's been my experience. Um, most of my patients, actually, uh, and we're we're talking a very small number. I, I've seen uh, five patients with Farber, um, and most of them have come out of rheumatology. And it's really my relationship, actually, with the rheumatologists in other lysosomal diseases that that's helped a lot. And they don't necessarily know what the disease uh, was, but they said it's it's not in our wheelhouse. We think it's more likely to be in your wheelhouse. So um, having that good relationship with the, the rheumatologist has certainly helped get those patients to me, uh, perhaps not as quickly uh, as, as uh, we would like, but uh, they do end up in the right place eventually. Once they do come to you, Paul, um, what are what are the different types of treatment options? Because we don't have any disease modifying uh, therapies uh, so far. So, what do you think uh, we can offer these patients with this very devastating disease? It's it's limited, mostly supportive therapy. Um, we uh, we try to control pain, pain with anti-inflammatory um, uh, non-steroidal medications. We try to um, uh, bring in physical therapy. We try to um, uh, ask uh, sort of gastroenterologists or pulmonologists to come and assist with particularly nutrition 
is is a, a very difficult area for the severe patient and pulmonary has to continue to to monitor the airway and decide uh, at what it, you know is it stable or is, does it actually need a tracheostomy i've had one uh, very good outcome with a patient um, who uh, had severe disease but uh, still neurologically intact and it was a, a stem, hematopoietic stem cell transplant and a good outcome of the transplant with resolution of nodules pain moves under complete control um, the hope is that as I mentioned in my individual lecture that it's really supplying the enzyme whether it's sure. infused given uh, uh, generated by a gene therapy or by a stem cell transplant, hopefully we'll get similar responses um, uh, systemically. The brain may be a different challenge, and we have to look eventually at enzyme that so may transfer to the brain or a direct um, uh, gene therapy um, that's brought in to, to focus on the brain. So it's almost you have two two pictures, how to treat the systemic disease and how to treat the CNS disease. Right now, it's mostly supported, but I was amazed at the transplant effects. Yeah, and I should clarify uh, with disease modifying, I think if we if we do do transplants, we can modify that peripheral, those peripheral manifestations, but it has not had any impact, uh, sadly, on the neurodegeneration. And that's where we're really lacking something in terms of uh, something to offer to these families, uh, which is somewhat different from what we would expect with some of the other neurodegenerative lysosomal storage diseases where we do see effect on uh, transplant. And uh, yeah, I would like to uh, echo your your uh, comments on on uh, tracheostomy or or perhaps also G tubes. Uh, a lot of these patients will have reflux, and uh, that can contribute to their uh, their their lung pathology uh, with recurrent aspiration pneumonias. So if we can find a different way to uh, allow them to feed and uh, absorb that nutrition which is uh, something that may also, uh, the underlying disease may also play a role in the, in the GI system. So I think if we can get them to grow and uh, absorb that food and make sure they're not uh, putting their lungs in danger, that's certainly a benefit as well. Pain is very- dealt with, yeah. Do you see the SMA PME group or if it's been I've all, seen- All Farber- uh, yeah, I've seen uh, one uh, patient with SMA PME, and this is, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, this is a sort of uh, a, a different disease that is caused by the same uh, gene uh, defect. And, and there is some crossover, and the patient I saw did actually have the uh, spinal muscular atrophy, uh, but he did have some uh, development of nodules as well. So I think this is where we need to look more at this population and see um, if there is more crossover than we think. They're mainly followed by the neurologists. So it might be that some of these nodules might be going missed. Uh, they're not being seen necessarily by rheumatologists or, or, or for that matter, not necessarily by geneticists or biochemical geneticists as well. So I think this is something that we really need to look at in, in more detail. And with the upcoming enzyme replacement therapy, the question would be, would this have any benefit for those patients uh, with primarily a neurological presentation? And that's where we might get into the, the transfer of this enzyme into uh, the CNS by, by various methods, which may need to be used. Have you, um, do you find that the neurologists are using um, uh, whole exome or whole genome methods, is this going to speed up diagnosis in rheumatology or neurology, or do they have to reach the geneticist to, to find this? So 
I think they do in 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 some of the larger centers, and certainly our our neurologists are very happy to order uh, panels. And and I th uh, the acid ceramides uh, gene is is actually on uh, some of the SMA panels now, so that can lead to earlier diagnosis rather than waiting for the geneticist uh, to to receive the consult. Um, and I think that can be beneficial in a number of ways. Uh, these types of panels where we're, we're thinking about a very rare disorder, but we don't necessarily uh, think specifically about Farber. Uh, the panels can include this gene in, in some of the lysosomal panels as well. So this can lead to earlier diagnosis, uh, certainly for our patients uh, thinking about this. And this is one of my patients did come through a rheumatologist who ordered uh, some of this testing. So I think that can be uh, beneficial as well. I think the, the holy grail will be to have newborn screening once we have a therapy and we will not miss these patients and we'll treat yeah. them. Once. Well, thanks very much, Paul, for uh, joining us today and, and having this discussion. I think this is a, a very rare disorder, but one that really uh, needs a lot more attention. And we need to learn a lot more about the natural history before we can get these earlier diagnoses and progress. And uh, do you have any more thoughts on that? No, I, I think it's it just remembering the triad um, hopefully will trigger everybody to refer to a geneticist or um, uh, send a panel or a whole a, a, an exome. Uh, so if you see nodules, you have to move outside your um, uh, your comfort zone with with uh, autoimmune arthritis and and think metabolic disease. Just the yeah. same. With yeah. Sydney Farber had the same debate: is this inflammatory, or is it genetic? And yeah, I think we we have to find these patients early, and and um, hopefully people will will stay aware. And I thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you, John. Always a pleasure, Paul. We, we will talk again. I'm sure we will. Thank you very much. Thank you.